you know, and I'm going back to the classics, and I'm noticing that all of the classics, um, for the most part in science fiction, many of the classics in fantasy are all men, generally all white men. Yeah. Um, and while there is, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> while there are more um, women and, and other diverse people coming into it, I think there's also still a, a fairly heavy strain of the same kind of history coming through. Um, kind of, what's your opinion of the history and what's going on? And I don't want to lead the question by saying, do you think it's enough or whatever? But there, there is no enough uh, in the sense. I mean, obviously, as you know, it's whoever's a good writer is a good writer, and we want them writing and we want to read their stuff. There, there are some a number of structural issues. One of them, and I don't know if this is true anymore, but one of them used to be that men would not buy women writers, but women would read male writers. So that was one of the reasons that, despite the fact that there were, a, you know, when I was coming up in the field, most of my writer friends were female, were women. So there were tons of women writers in the field, but the big sellers tended to be men. And part of that, I think, was that structural thing, which is that men had, had both readerships available to them, whereas a lot of, especially like teenage boys, would see somebody, like friends of mine from the time, I'm thinking of like Judith Tarr or Teresa Edgerton or other people that I knew and hung out with, or uh, Alice Rasmussen, and they would just go, oh, it's a girl book. You know, despite the fact that there were pictures right there on the cover for the slow-witted of somebody whacking the head off of a large monster with a sword. You know, I mean, it was pretty clear that it was not some kind of old-fashioned T and E crumpets lady book. But still, they were reluctant. So I hope that's changing, but I have no idea. Do you have any take on that? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, it, it, you can look sort of sociologically at that, sort of the influences. Uh, on all of our media um, and, and what is driving those things. Um, but then you have to look at how things are marketed. Um, it's just, um, it's a huge, huge thing to fight against. Uh, I certainly made a point in, in the Malazan stuff to, to run right against that as, as quickly as I could. Um, but I still have sort of fans saying, well, I, I didn't know that, that character had dark skin. Well, I, I said it on page one, you know? <laughs> but you know, so they carry with them their own, you know, their own sort of pictures um, that when they create these characters, and uh, it, yeah, it can be frustrating because it, it is so Eurocentric, um, and you know, even the notion of what you carry over from from our world, um, you know, if you were to sort of think of a quasi fourth century BC Athens. Um, uh, I guess you would think in terms of the physical characteristics of, of modern day Greeks or whatever, um, but you wouldn't think in terms of the physical characteristics of, say, um, somebody from the Congo. But why not? You know, it, it, really, why not? And so we carry so much of these assumptions with us that, that are cultural tags that we put on, 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 on physical features and, and, um, and on gender. And you know it, it, it does pervade things. And I guess the only thing I would say is the only thing I sort of when I talk to or write essays on this kind of stuff, it, it's basically saying to fantasy other fantasy writers that, that we at least be aware of, uh, of the assumptions you're carrying with you and uh, challenge those assumptions. Yeah, in our field, not always, but generally, it tends to be a bit more subtle than say Caucasian blonde Jesus, you know, which you see in certain kinds of certain parts of, of the culture, you know, the idea that Jesus pretty much looked like Patrick Swayze or something like that, you know. And that's an extreme example, but, but as, as Stephen points out, I mean, we have to, it's, it, it's a more subtle form, but it's still there, and it's there for all of us. I am, I am rotten with, with the, the, uh, a certain kind of blindness to some, some stuff that I have, to, I have to literally work on, you know, when I'm writing a female character, I, I have to spend a lot of time kind of pulling stuff out of my head and saying, what makes you think that? Why, is, why are you thinking that? Let's just put that aside. That's not useful. That's, that's an artifact. And that, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what you're writing about. But I think that that is, in general, getting better. I think that good writers 
will always be working in that direction. And the more people work that way, slowly, 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 the larger changes start to happen. So have you found anything that you like so far that really worked for you? Yeah, what? Oh, the Ender's Game. Okay. Scott Card's books. Very exciting. And Speaker for the Dead. I don't always agree with Mr. Card about a lot of things, but I think Speaker for the Dead oh, yeah. is a wonderful, uh, yeah. maybe his best in um, some ways. What, what got him interested in reading in general was the, the whole um, uh, Catch and Fire. The, uh, oh, oh, the uh, Hunger Games, yeah. Which I thought had a fantastic email. There is some amazing stuff going on, which we don't even have time to talk about, and we're not probably the people to do it anyway, but there's some amazing stuff going on in YA. Um, I think that probably at this point, since they're going to want us to sign books and stuff, Angela, yeah? Okay, so we'll just want to say, um, yeah. Thank you. Stephen and myself, yes, thank you very much for your time and your presence.